So welcome to Incident Response is hard, but it doesn't have to be. So my name is Michael Goff. Hello, my name is Michael. I'm a logaholic. You're catching on. Um, I am the co-founder, I'm the founder of Mauer Archaeology and the co-founder of IMF Security, LogMD. I do happen to be a sponsor, so please ignore that. This is not a sponsor talk. Uh, how many people here have used or heard of the Windows Logging Cheat Sheet series? Okay. So uh, some of you have a clue with some of what's in this talk. Um, I am also the co-creator of LogMD. If you haven't visited the booth, go visit the booth, and we can have a discussion there, but this is not about that. So a little background. Uh, I worked in a video game company a few years ago. There goes my water. And I had to deal with the WinNTI Chinese hacking group. Um, and if you haven't read the WinNTI report by Kaspersky, I would recommend it. They have moved outside that. Uh, I think uh, ESET has recently come out with their latest exploits in gaming. Um, so that's where I cut my teeth in regards to really applying what I knew. Um, they got by all of our security tools. So it really kind of puzzled us. Uh, we actually uh, looked into why and reported to some of the, the uh, vendors what we found and how to break their tools. Uh, some of them actually knew about it, and that was kind of a bummer. But clearly the Chinese knew about it. Um, and often red teamers do the same thing, right? John and gang, whoever, they'll bypass the, the tools in order to uh, do their foo and, and laugh and say, I got by your EDR or AV. So what did we learn, and how did we catch them? I was asked by an IR consulting, uh, consulting firm um, one of the ones I deal with, and they said, hey, are the people you deal with mature? And I went, sadly, no. And he looked at me because he knew they used state-of-the-art EDR, they had AV, um, they seemed to have a lot of other tools, some of them had log management. The funny thing that I found in dealing with these business partners and people I work with is they do buy this stuff. They go see the blinky box, they hit the easy button, they install it, maybe even configure it, um, but they lack security 101, the real basics. And oddly, the stuff they already had that's free, they were not utilizing or turning on. So I don't like the word prevention. Our solution is a prevention solution. No, really, it's not. It's a reduction solution. Because if prevention worked, we wouldn't still all be here at these conferences learning because prevention continues to fail us. So really, it's reduction in my view. So if you buy the solution, just realize you're reducing your, your vectors, you're really not preventing them. If you're lucky and can totally prevent them, please do a talk on how you did that, because a lot of us could use that lesson. So again, we reduce the likelihood of an incident or the attack surface. We're not really preventing it. Um, so they can be taken advantage of or exploited. So mainly one of the things to make sure incident response isn't hard is to prepare. Security 101. And I call it Security 101 because everybody in this room should do it to themselves, their home, their personal work computers, and then hopefully share that and, and you know, grow it internally within the organization. Uh, I find it sadly ignored. Uh, I deal with probably 35 business partners, and you would think one of them uh, would have passed my muster of basic logging even to the CIS benchmarks, and sadly no. Uh, and it might include InfoSec. Maybe the InfoSec people aren't telling the IT people to turn this stuff on. I, I really don't know. Um, but if you have some basic things, um, again, they're free. You already have them in your environment. Um, an incident is much easier and faster to deal with when you call an IR firm or somebody like me. It's also how we caught the WinNTI hacks and many others since. Uh, when we released a game in 2012, uh, Windows 8.1 and 2012 server came out, and we built the game on that platform. Fortunately, they introduced command line logging. And by dumb luck, because of what I do for a living, I had found this feature that Microsoft did not advertise very much, uh, probably through a SANS talk, one of my Mannion friends or whatnot. And I went and turned it on an environment. Um, and that's a, a big way that I caught these guys because, again, they bypassed all the security tools. So again, in preparing, help us help you, okay? Show of hands, how many people here have the Windows Advanced Policies configured to at least the CIS benchmarks? Now notice how many hands were up for the actual cheat sheets, and we have a, only a few of the CIS. How about the Windows Logging Cheat Sheets? How many have turned those way up? See, there's an example of how, why don't all of you have everything turned up to the CIS at a minimum? Uh, well, okay, human beings are lazy, money, probably good reasons. 
But this is really less than an hour's worth of work in GPO, seriously. Um, but this is what I'm finding is, is organizations are not doing this. And if you've ever done IR, how many people here have done true IR, hardcore IR? How many people, though, those their hands are up, keep your hands up if the logging was adequate to do your job? Yet yeah, no hands. Okay, you're just proving my point. So please enable command line logging. Please turn on this logging. You may not get any use out of it, or your firm may not get any use out of it, but trust me, IR firms, people like ourselves, your IR people, forensics people will love it. And oh, by the way, Nix and Apple have logs too, so turn them on. Uh, do you have a log management solution, EDR, or other security prevention solution? Um, again, EDR can collect local logs often. I use an EDR solution. I can reach out to the system, pull back the local logs. I do my foo on the side while the triage is collecting for a couple hours. And by that time, I've already scanned the logs with, with probably an obvious choice. And I figure out what's going on before the triage. And then I actually can focus on the triage of what I'm looking for. Um, again, because the logs were turned on properly. Uh, log management, obviously, with a good agent collecting all the right things. I know John and I have had discussions about this. Collect all the things your log management solutions would love for you to send every piece of log data you have to your SIM, but really don't send the right things. Uh, it does provide a ton of data for investigations, right? So if you can at least turn it on, if there is a SIM or an IR firm wants to use a SIM, and there's cases where people like Mannion have gone in and the actors are killing the EDRs and their tools, because they know what they're using, and they have had to result in using an actual log management solution, and they've turned up the logging either because it was already there or they manually turned it up. So collecting the right things really is powerful and can really provide IR people, forensics people, and consultancies a lot of information. Uh, it makes it easier and faster for sure, uh, and on the long run, it will save you significant money. I'll give you a story. In, in 2014, when we had a manian come out to investigate, we had a retainer, so we had to use them and blow the money somehow because we lose the retainer if you don't use a service. We had them come out, and we said, okay, our management wants you to verify what we found. They left in three days. Usually, they're there for two weeks. We just paid for our salaries and the monies we saved. It's serious hard dollars you can save if you do this pre preparation ahead of time. So how many people here, uh, again, you can do a show of hands, do you or can you monitor for new account creations, admin accounts, logging on to multiple systems, new service creations, new task creations, email, VPN, Citrix, cloud logins, suspicious processors, processes and C users? How many people here literally do a good job of this? I think they do. A few hands. And not without good logging can you do this, right? If you don't turn on what's more than default in Windows, you're not going to get squat. Uh, Nix and Apple do a much better job. You can't monitor for anything if you don't enable good log logging and the right things, thus the cheat sheets. Um, that's why I wrote them, actually, is because what came out of the WinNTI attacks was how did we catch them? It turned out that command line logging that we were collecting in Splunk, when they started executing all the administrative commands, lit up our dashboards like a Christmas tree because they were doing net uses and net configs, net users. They were doing all the, the recon they could. Some making typos because English wasn't their, their normal language. And so they made a lot of mistakes, which generated more events. And that information that we collected from the list of known admin uh, executables, which is also on malware archaeology and Ardvar Moe's uh, lolbin list, um, we monitored for that. And they triggered the hell out of it. And that's actually how we caught them. They bypassed Tripwire, they bypassed uh, Tipping Point, they bypassed the AV, which is uh, a big vendor with a former crazy owner, um, and they even bypassed Bit9. So uh, we were definitely challenged with the fact that they got by our security tools. Um, if you have a log management solution, then yay, you can send it to log management, create some queries and everything else. So, you know, feed your SIM, Splunk, Elk, Humio, whatever. Um, but again, you still have to enable stuff. So get with your IT guys, get the GPOs, turn the stuff on, follow the cheat sheets, and then do an actual investigation. You will thank me later, trust me. Um, of course, uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, I am showing a demo of Arthur. So this is a plug for the tool uh, shack, chest, shed, tool shed over there. Um, Arthur is a free open source tool. It's a fork of Kanza. This is how we push out tools with WinRM in the environment. Again, free. How many people here use WinRM or have enabled it? And you can lock it down with the Windows firewall. So there is a way to secure it. Um, so come look at how we do that in the booth tomorrow uh, in that room upstairs behind that bar over there. And of course, you can come see how we hunt and do things with the booth for LogMD. 
Um, have you guys ever considered this? Have you used a uh, free or paid, free slash paid, a freemium model cloud solution for any logging? Anybody do this now? A few hands. Um, how about this? Configure an agent with all the right things, of all the stuff you'd want to send to a sim. Maybe use the free solution to validate that you're collecting all the things you want, and you filtered out all the stuff you don't want. And then get it working. And then push that config out to all of your machines as a service. Put it in manual mode. It's there waiting to be used. And when you have an incident, you flick it to start, and you send the stuff to a cloud solution after you beg management to pay for it for a month, or you use a free trial for 30 days, hint, hint. A lot of them do that. You can fully use all the features. And hopefully, you'll finish your IR engagement in 30 days and then say, thanks for the email. Um, but I didn't tell you that. But you pay as you need it, but be prepared to use it. A lot of people don't realize if you at least put the agents out there and you've enabled the right things, you are ready to go by flipping this stuff on through GPO to start the service and actually send those machines you're investigating to a cloud instant. No hardware or servers to configure or hold up. Uh, Humio, for example, is a free paid solution. Uh, five systems, roughly, you can get two gigs a day, seven day retention. So if you want to play with this, there's a sample for free. Um, but there's more than just logs. I am a logaholic, but uh, again, you must prepare. How many people here uh, use LAPS, the local administrator? Oh, shoot, more hands than turned on logging. Okay, you all just go home. Logging, man. But this is important because those guys over there in the red team sides, and probably some of you in the audience, uh, we'll try to pwn a password on a local admin, not a domain admin. You'll get there, I'm sure, because most organizations won't catch it because you saw that slide earlier. Um, but if you use LAPS, every local admin password on that box, which is usually ignored, is now different and can be looked up in group policy with a PowerShell script or within the console. Um, and this will trigger a whole lot of noise of failed logins when the bad guys start trying to log in as administrator because they guessed one of them or the amendment cast one of the boxes they popped. Um, so this is kind of handy. It actually will trigger a lot of noise when a guy starts trying to laterally move and they start pounding at your local accounts that they know and they think they have the password to but are different on every machine. So again, LAPS is a great way to do this and again, fully configured in AD. Um, and it will make it much harder to laterally move. So group policy and security. Um, there was a great talk at DerbyCon, so this is a pitch for uh, this talk. Uh, you can watch Sean Metcalf's talk on Iron Geek's site. Um, really good AD talk. So I talked to him about creating a cheat sheet, and he informed me they are creating a, a white paper on it. Um, but if you're going to do AD security, and this goes as far as being able to do recon and actually cause no results to be returned in the recon from a red team perspective or an APT perspective, um, I really liked what he had in this, in this uh, presentation, so please take a walk, uh, take a look at it. But there's lots you can do and prepare for. Again, free. I know, people are not free. Time is not free. But again, you don't have to buy anything. Um, you can configure AD and do quite a bit to really screw with the red team and the APTers. So take a look at Sean's work. It's very good. Slow them down, make noise, creates log entries, creates alerts in a sim. So that's the, the ge general idea. How about two-factor? I hate to actually mention this, um, and nobody will raise their hand if I ask who doesn't use two-factor on their internet-facing email, Citrix, VPN, RDP, et cetera. And I know Microsoft last week had a real bummer with this one. Um, but again, uh, password stealing and how many people click on stuff in organizations is mind-blowing. Our red teams are consistently getting cred stealing successfully. So if you just put frickin' tokens on Citrix boxes and internet logins, you will shatter their ability to be successful because they just won't have the tokens. And yes, two-factor can be bypassed and, and social engineered much harder, much more noise, lower uh, success rate. But again, the MFA will cripple these attacks and help you have lousy passwords protected by good MFA. Um, this will help a lot of things. The whole Microsoft Office, if you're using Microsoft Office, Outlook 365, 0365, and you're not two-factoring it, please do not use the suppress 60-day feature. Please don't do that. Don't do that. Because you're basically turning off the two-factor for the period of time. Um, but this will help so many things. So really, make two-factor. You will have to buy something here. Unfortunately, this is not free. But this is a huge bonus. If you have to have these services published to the internet, or you put them behind a VPN, please two-factor that. 
prepare for it because the bad guys will exploit these passwords, either from previous breaches because of password reuse, they'll steal your own damn creds from email phishing, or they'll just guess them with brute forces on your, on your facing systems. Again, how many people here look at failed logins and how many people here look at successful logins? If they got a login and it's successful, are you looking at the country origin? Do you have load balancers in front of Exchange? It's really hard to know the country of origin when you're using load balancers in front of Citrix and Exchange. So again, two-factor will really help you here. How about email? Uh, we have an email friend right here, so this is uh, near and dear to his hearts. Um, how many people are blocking, Microsoft just came out with a new list, but how many people here are blocking automatically in their SMTP gateway and or Exchange the known list of bad executables or file extensions that Microsoft has published? There's 100 of them roughly. Yeah, he's an email guy because that's who he is. So there's one. They just reduced another list because of the issues they're having in Office 365. They added another 38. Um, this is kind of shocking to me. You should block these. Like, don't allow these in your organization. But I need JavaScript to be sent to me. Fine, zip it up and password protect it. And teach people how to send a zip file and then another email with the password. Um, because what do bad guys do? They send you a zip file and the password in the same email. So teach your users how to do this, please. Um, but they've been around a long time, and I've talked about this and how to avoid ransomware. Please block these. We dropped our email attacks tremendously by doing e the evaluation of the incoming successful attacks, looking at the attachments, and immediately blocking them. And unfortunately, our IT organization wouldn't do the whole list, but as we showed them the data, every time we said, now block this, now block this, they did. They just needed the data to back it up. So you may have to go through that exercise. Better yet, have you uh, thought about changing the way file extensions work when a user double clicks them. I call this deny the double click. For example, does a user really need to double click a JavaScript or WSF or WSH or C script or W script file? Really, do they need to double click this? No. Here's a thought. Why not change the file association to open something like, I don't know, Notepad? So it doesn't execute the engine and it just opens a Notepad and suddenly these payloads don't execute. So if you can't block, maybe you can get them to not double click the dang things. All right, so here's another option for you. Again, group policy, easy fix. Uh, we did this and literally eliminated our uh, infections of these, of these script engine extensions. It was amazingly effective. And by the way, it won't break the actual execution if you call them correctly. W scripts space the name. It only disables the double click file associations. And Microsoft, in a full OS upgrade, will break those, by the way. So your GPO will have to force them back. Uh, I have reported that to Microsoft as a very uh, bothersome thing that they do. How about network prep? How many people here, uh, A, know what PCR is, producer consumer ratio, and B, have this in an organization? Show of hands, anybody doing this or know this, like Bricotta devices? If you're a Cisco house, it's total bytes. You don't get the in and out unless you buy more hardware. A lot, a lot more expensive hardware. So the idea here is um, there is a bytes in and bytes out. And there's a mathematical formula um, that you can calculate what's going on to say, is this user behavior surfing, request out, data download in, meaning it's a minus scenario, more data in than out, or is this a more data out than in, an exfil condition, something that you'll see in Dropbox or a win log beat, a Splunk universal forwarder, a file beat, et cetera, where I'm sending a whole lot of data out, but I'm not requesting data in. If you can send this data alone to a SIM and filter on plus five or greater, you're gonna find all the drop boxes and Google Drives and, and potential exfills going on in your environment because these external connections out to the internet are going to be one way for the most part, very little C2 traffic coming back. So uh, definitely look into how you can do that. Another thing uh, we found with the Chinese WinNTI group, uh, and we've seen this in multiple attacks, um, there's clearly lots of examples of this in use. Whoops, don't touch the screen. DNS text records. Uh, Cisco gives this to you, and you can see how long it is. You can even see what's in it. So how many people here look at the DNS text records for the length of the text record? Because anything longer than, say, 100 bytes is generally going to have something in it that shouldn't be in it. But oddly enough, AV uses this for some reason, so you will have some false positives. 
but we also caught the WinNTI doing their C2 through DNS text records. So if you have Cisco logs and you're not collecting DNS text records or Palo or anybody else, and looking at the length of these, again, you can prepare to be able to do this because this is something an IR firm or a network guy like our opening speaker yesterday talked about. This is really valuable data. So prepare and understand how to get this out of your systems for network. And length can definitely indicate bad. How about email and web prep? Another show of hands. Uh, how many people here will actually block unregistered domains in their incoming email and their web proxy. So this is where a site, oh, we've got one, two, that's three. So we've got a four or five, all right, so we got a few. Uh, this will kill malware like nobody's business. One of the things we always look at when we get malware that's successfully in through a URL is we go look up the categorization of it. Is it a known blog, is it a known store site, is it in the Alexa top million? You know, pick your poison. But if you actually turn this on, yeah, malware is going to disappear because all the C2, most of what they're using, is all uncategorized. So if you can be prepared to block this or actually do block this, so if you get a really bad scenario and you turn this on to block everything, yeah, you might have some vendors and whatnot that have really crappy email systems, so you'll have a problem with that. But for the most part, you'll kill a lot of the C2 traffic because they're putting them on uncategorized servers. Um, unless, of course, they popped a WordPress of the week and they've got some really good WordPress sites. Uh, they'll be alive for a short period of time until they're found. Those are categorized. Uh, not Ben, not Ben, all right? That's probably a Ben 10 uh, mistake there. Um, but again, prepare to block them in the case of an incident. Prepare, prepare, prepare. How many people here use WinRM? A handful, so good. Uh, prepare for this as well. So there's like four or five GPO settings. You can configure it, again, like I said earlier, with the Windows firewall to protect it. So only Martin's box and my box can run WinRM. So when the bad guy tries to do, do it, he'll generate a failed WinRM execution in the WinRM log. Again, if you enable it and collect it, uh, it's good stuff. But again, if you don't have an enterprise solution and you want to run something on every box in your environment, WinRM is a remote PowerShell capability of using command line against all the systems in your environment. At 2 o'clock, again, on Friday, I'll be showing off Arthur. It's an example of a package that uses WinRM. And I can push out tools like LogMD or SysInternals or anything else on 1 to 100 machines, and I'll demonstrate that at 2 o'clock. But this is something that's really powerful. I, as an IR guy or even as a, as a consultant that does uh, compromise assessments, I can look in the environment and query your AD. I can dump all your workstations. I can dump your accounts. I can do all kinds of things. And then I can use that information to then run jobs against the environment. And, and try logins and try brute forcing and all kinds of neat stuff, red team and blue team. Um, but again, uh, it should be ready to roll. If you don't know how to do it, please look into it. Have it ready to flip the bit in the case of an incident. Put it in your incident response plan for sure. And again, it's free, right? It's built into group policy. Um, and I, here's where I mentioned again that you can secure it with the Windows firewall. And it does have logs so you can monitor what's going on. How about hunting? How many people here actively or proactively hunt. All right, so we're getting more, that's good. Uh, some, say, some say hunting is the creation of a hypothesis or theory, and then you go searching for it. Yeah, I don't quite look at it that way. You can do that later, but I wanna say I look for things that are obvious known IOCs or artifacts, and I say eliminate that you don't have these. For example, does anybody here do a check of all the auto runs in their environment, and then verify they're none bad, a couple? Um, how about WMI database entries? How about funky, obfuscated PowerShell or Base64? How about a binary in the AppData local directory or AppData local low or AppData roaming? Or funky directory names under AppData local? You see my point? This is where 90% of malware lives. So if you look at these things and eliminate you don't have these on a regular basis, you can expand your hunting beyond that and then create a hypothesis and theories and further, further go hunt for indicators. And again, 90% of most Typical malware attacks share what I just mentioned in common. And also, execution of C users. Most malware does execute there. And then we'll move out as they gain privs. So if you do good preparation, then IR becomes much easier and much faster. Again, it will save you money uh, because IR firms, the better you are, the faster they work. The more data they have, the more efficient they are, the faster they work, the faster they get the report. Um, and so therefore you're saving money. And you can justify your salary much like I did when we kicked out Mandian after three days. Um, another side story there. In the 2014 attack, 
uh, we still had some retainer money, so we sent them an infected VM um, that we knew all the WinNTI 2014 stuff uh, did. You don't have to ask me what exactly, take, take too long to explain it here. Um, and they came back and said the VM was clean, and then we walked their team through how it was infected. That was like an awesome happy dance moment. Um, it, because they have an automated process just like everybody else, and guess what, the bad guys know that as well. And so if you put a little bit of effort into your foo, you can get by these automated checks, sandboxes, evaluations, things like that. And yes, IR consultancies. But it also, if you do this preparation, it also enables you to be able to hunt as now you'll have more data to look at. For example, if you turn on process command line logging, it's one of the recommendations in the malware archaeology Windows logging cheat sheets, and we check it with LogMD to show that it's enabled. It is not a recommendation in the CIS benchmarks. But if you turn that on, which by the way, most EDRs will collect, so it's being collected anyway if you have an EDR. If you turn this on, I can now go hunting for, say, bitsadmin.exe and slash transfer. I can now go look at these uh, whitelisting application bypass low bins and look for HTTP under regserv32 or rundll32 or regasm. Uh, I can look for all those and see that there's weird parameters being executed. But I can't do that if you don't turn the stuff on. Um, and again, go watch the demo. We'll, we'll show you how to remotely do it for free. Um, and again, verify that you don't have these known things that are common amongst most malware and most APT attacks. They start in the user space. They tend to hit the user run keys. They tend to add new services. They tend to hit the WMI database. They hide payloads in the registry, the so-called fileless malware. Not really, the files in the registry. Or they hide the scripts or the payloads in the WMI database. Again, not fileless. They're just putting it somewhere different. Or they stick it in memory. System shuts down like Drydex, writes it to disk, writes the run key, system boots up, reads the run key, runs the executable, deletes them both, so live, there's nothing there. right? So if you turn this stuff on, you can catch this stuff. And then thus hunt for it, or hunt better. So I say hunt for the things to know you don't have them and eliminate, eliminate them if you do. Uh, Re-image or literally remediate the box. Auto runs. Large keys containing payloads or script. It's pretty obvious if you do that. Um, we can show you some examples over in the booth if you want. Null byte entries. So Kofter did this. They write null byte entries in the registry so that reg queries and reg edit will not show you that what's in the actual values. So this is a great trick for red teamers, as well as uh, the bad guys, where they'll hide their stuff, and you'll go to look at it in regedit, or a SOC analyst will look at it in regedit, or do a reg query from the command line, and you won't see anything, because the null byte will cause the, the interpreter to crash, and it won't be able to return the data. You'll see everything else there, but you won't see the bad entry. Suspicious WMI database entries. How many people here have actually validated they don't have any scripts or payloads in WMI database? How many tools actually do this? Right, so again, prepare for this. Figure out how you can execute this and, and do it. How about looking for PowerShell executions or obfuscations? Uh, generally, this is not something that's normal. When Daniel Bohannon did his talk at DerbyCon a few years back, and him and I talked before he did the, 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 uh, the talk about what we do in regards to looking for obfuscation, he came out with this talk. He says, I have power obfuscation. I'm going to show you every way to Sunday to launch PowerShell. And all your spell checking and word searching and all the stuff that all these tools look at will break seriously. And he was right. He broke them all over the place. And then not six months later, the bad guys started using his techniques. Then last year, he came out with dofuscation. And not six months later, every malware I see pretty much now has some sort of dofuscation. If they're using PowerShell, PowerShell they're using PowerShell obfuscation. So you need to be able to look for that by counting the funky characters, if a minimum. You can look at the ticks and the pluses and all the funny quotes and count those up. Normal PowerShell will not have a lot of these. So counting alone is a great indicator. Base64, that's not used very often normally. So look for that. Uh, the PowerShell logs, if done correctly, per the cheat sheets, will de-obfuscate that Base64 right in the logs for you. I can show you an example in the booth if you want to see how that works. Uh, look for any suspicious executions of C users. <coughs> Chrome, Firefox, obviously are in there. Notepad++, all the utilities that users use. But this is also where malware generally starts. The dropper will execute here in percent temp or percent app data because every user has it. It's writable by the user double clicking the URL or the, or the payload in the email and it will start the infection. Then they'll elevate and move out from there if they can. So look for any executions there. If you're gonna, if I'm gonna tell you one thing to collect into SIM to start with the value of SIM, collect every execution and see users, filter out your known good binaries and see what comes out that's abnormal anything new for the most part, uh, you'll find that to be a very valuable case if you have a lot of malware coming in from a user space. Uh, suspicious admin or low bin executions. 
This is what caught WinNTI in 2012 and 2014 because they bypassed our tools. So just the fact that they launched net.exe and ipconfig and ARP and all the things they do in their, in their recon uh, triggered these alerts and that's how we caught them. Injected processes, right? Memware, so I call this stuff, it's not fileless malware. It's powerware, PowerShellware, because it's using PowerShell in some way. Memware, because it's injecting in memory. Regware, because it's sitting in registry. WMIware, because it's sitting in the WMI database. If it's memware, it's injected into memory. Again, once it, the system shuts down, it can write the disk, write to disk, write to the reg key, and then restart in a million ways to Sunday. Windows has a lot of options to, to compromise itself. Um, but look for these executions. Look for injected processes. Find a way to do this. Prepare to look for this in your IR engagements. Because this is a great way to eliminate you don't have anything running. You can come to the booth. I can show you more about that. And there's many more, but this is a short list. Start here. Prepare to be able to look for these things, and you'll help not only yourselves in an IR engagement, but any firm or any consultancy or individual like myself that comes out and helps you. Um, if you hunt uh, for things that are not found, uh, in 90% of today's malware in your systems, you can eliminate or reduce the probability that you do not have obvious indicators. 90%. It's probably higher than that. That list I just showed you, because I rarely see stuff outside that unless you're getting into the WinNTI space. But again, they also execute some of the things I mentioned, especially the admin utilities. The red teamers will execute them as they're doing recon on you. They're going to laterally move, so that's another area you can look at. Uh, login information. WMI, by the way, in Windows 10 and 2016, 2019 server, has two logins for WMI, not one. It's a dead giveaway of lateral movement with WMI. Uh, you can watch my talk on that at DerbyCon two years ago. Um, again, so this helps you in an incident because, again, you're prepared. Same tools, doesn't matter what, and the logic applies. Whatever tools you have, the same logic will apply. You'll just have to figure out how within your tool set how to do this in your EDR, your SIM, or, or whatever security tools you have. Um, because you are prepared and enable things, you will be able to hunt and find things much easier. How many people here uh, know about MITRE Tech? Winning, good job. How many people here uh, map all the stuff I've asked you to MITRE Attack? Yeah, not so many, right? Uh, so guess what my number one recommendation is? Uh, map your stuff to MITRE Attack, please. Because the things I mentioned, if you actually go map those to MITRE Attack, you're in a nice loop process that you can improve over time. Um, for example, and again, I can show you some examples that we have over at the booth. Um, but this is really powerful because as you solve some of these, um, you will then see that you can do others. And if you get repetitive at some of these easy ones, then you can start tackling the harder ones. And you can expand what you do. If you have a red team engagement, and they do not or will not provide you a mapping of their attack to MITRE attack, the techniques used, do not hire them. It should be a number one requirement of all red team engagements is to map what they did to you with MITRE attack. They don't have to show you the .NET foo that they used. They just have to tell you the technique ID. You then have to figure out how to detect that technique ID. Okay, this is how MITRE ATT&CK really helps us from a preparation of IR scenario. Uh, and then you map your hunts to MITRE ATT&CK. In Arthur, in the module, we have a space to register your MITRE ATT&CK technique ID or IDs. Um, I came up with what we call tech, uh, MITRE ATT&CK technique ID groupings. So unfortunately, some of the queries in log management will cover 10, 20, 30 technique IDs. For example, just looking at C user process execution will nail about 20. I can't put that all in a query name. I just can't. So I have to group them together with a TG 10003. And in some wiki or spreadsheet, I'll keep track that TG 10003 are these 20 or 10 or 3 technique IDs. And then I can use that actual shortcut in my query name, saved in Splunk or Humia or whatever, or in my Arthur module, or in my hunts, however I want to do it. But now I can start saving these things. So you might consider grouping several techniques together because that's logical, just the way MITRE is laid out, that some of your things will overlap into multiples and you'll have to come up with a shortcut. Because you're not going to call it T1003, 1241, 1325. You're just not going to do that. So come up with a shortcut on that. But definitely map your stuff to MITRE ATT&CK. It will help you in the long run for sure. It will also help you map your shortcomings. So you can go to management and say, I don't have anything that can look for these things. This is a big gap for us. And you can start those discussions. And guess what? Consultants use MITRE ATT&CK. Red teams use MITRE ATT&CK. Architects use MITRE ATT&CK that you might hire from the outside. And they can tell you and verify what you've come up with on your own. So it's a common language. 
you know, that we can use from a red team, blue team to make purple to say, here's the techniques that I use to attack you. Here's the techniques I use to detect you. Here's what we missed. Hey, I need budget, Mr. Manager. And he can obviously get uh, Gartner's approval of MITRE ATT&CK because they definitely support it. And we're all speaking a common language, MITRE ATT&CK. It's wonderful stuff. And there's a cheat sheet, by the way, for MITRE ATT&CK and Windows Logs if you couldn't have guessed that by now. Um, but again, this preparation will help you in the long run for IR. If you get this process going, then looking for harder things, you'll already done some of the easier ones. You can then ramp up your game if needed. Or show this to an IR firm that you have to call in because it's really bad. They'll love you for it as well. But attack gives you the things you can map your defenses to or that you can have. Everyone will have gaps. That's OK. Gaps are fine. Um, uh, Sands third last uh, year at uh, New Orleans. Uh, Rob Lee did a great overhead projection. I don't know if anybody saw that, where he literally brought an overhead projector out and did the old scribble on a thing. It was awesome. And he said, too many people get hung up that if there's four things associated with the attack, I have to detect all four things. You actually don't. You have to detect enough to know that you're being attacked by this thing. If you miss a couple of them, the AKA gaps, that's OK. If I'm generating enough noise with the admin compromise, the fact that they got in, I'll figure out later, but I've detected something that they've done, and now I can go digging deeper. So you don't have to detect all four or 40 or all 320 of the MITRE ATT&CK techniques. 200 is probably a good coverage. You will have gaps, that's okay, but make sure you don't have total gaps where there's a technology area you just can't cover, and MITRE is really good at helping you find those if you map them out. I would recommend printing in a big 40, 48, 36 by 48 laminated poster of the MITRE ATT&CK matrix and literally go get yourself some erasable markers and start mapping what your team can do and invite each network team in, invite the IT team in, and start color coding just red, yellow, green, or just you know of what you can do, what you think you do okay, or what you totally can't do in red, for example. Um, and just start brainstorming on that just to kind of get an idea where you sit here. But this is preparation you can definitely do. That will help you because as red teams attack you, pen testers attack you, AP tiers or the bad guy gets in, um, you'll know where your gaps are and you can focus at, at spending a little more time when needed for that. Um, and again, what your current defenses are, what do you have that you're using now? What can it cover in MITRE ATT&CK? You might find that you think it's doing something that it really can't. Uh, there are a lot of EDRs that, by the way, do not cover e MITRE ATT&CK 100%. I wouldn't even say some do 80%. If you want to check yours, go look at run DLL 32 and all the command parameters after that and see how much you can get executed without your EDR. I guarantee most of you are going to get by on that one. The red teamers do all the time, by the way. Um, and again, prepare knows what you can and cannot do. Preparing isn't just what you can do, but know what you can't do, right? Failure is okay if you learn from it. So understand that failure says, okay, we have a gap here. Let's see if we can solve it. Let's map it to MITRE and see if we can come up with a solution. You may have to call a product and say, this product's dead to us. It just isn't covering enough. We're going to go with this instead. Um, don't be afraid to throw a product out for another one that has better mappings to MITRE. So the conclusion. IR is hard, but it doesn't have to be. Preparation is absolutely key. The pickerel model, the first word in pickerel is preparation. So even, even Sands will tell you that. Um, but it's, it's crucial because I've lived this. I've gone from an environment that had nothing. I still deal with environments that have nothing. I turn this stuff on even after the attack is going, and then I start catching things that I didn't catch before because the data just wasn't there. So again, Security 101, enable what you already have. We saw how many people are using LAPS, but not as many were doing automatic audit logging that's already there as well. So you guys have homework to do. It's not just about laps, it's also about audit logging. Um, block well-known file, uh, exploitable file types, please, one way or the other, double click, denial, block it at the gateway. You will be shocked at how much malware will disappear. Yes, they will move to DNS slash URL type attacks, that's fine. Now you can focus that, that gap and worry about how I'm gonna detect funky DNS either through uh, uh, reputation or threat intel, I don't care how you do it, but now you can focus them, right? You've reduced this threat vector and you now can focus on another, like uh, using URLs instead of uh, actual uh, email attachments. Block unknown domains, right? This is the, uh, this is the uncategorized stuff, or be prepared to do it. This is a big win for cutting off C2 servers. But oh, by the way, 
you might want to consider black holding the C2 server IPs to a netcat box on Rackspace or somewhere. Uh, we killed a WinNTI infection once, and they wasted the machine because of it. So they had a kill switch inside the malware. You've been warned. Uh, Sony, anybody, right? So same scenario. Sony didn't take them seriously, and bam, total wipeout of Sony. Uh, so be careful of that if you're going to do that. Um, but a powerful weapon for sure if you're prepared to do it. Uh, unique local admin passwords, uh, A, trigger more noise of failures, make it more successful. Fix the failures you have because someone forgot to rotate a password on a server that has a service running as administrator or whatnot. Um, please don't use administrator. Create another account name, please. I really recommend Honey accounts. Put one at A, put one at like H, put one at like M, put one at like R and Z, and then monitor for those very heavily because when the red team dumps all those creds, they'll start using them, and guess what? They can trigger all kinds of alerts. Um, so please do that, especially the ones with administrative privilege. Come up with some clever ideas there for honey creds. Didn't make the list, but unique passwords, you get the idea. Uh, prep your network to see things. Producer-consumer ratio, right? What's the first thing management asks you? Did we lose any data? PCR can help you with that. So de determine whether your equipment can do it. Figure out if you can add a solution to do it or a way you can check it. Uh, we investigated a consultant box, for example, had Kovter on it. Uh, the consultant was doing some work for us. Um, all we knew is it triggered our, our alerts. We investigated the box. We found in the Shrum database for 60 days this box had been infected. So I could adequately you know, tell them absolutely this box is infected. It, and I could also tell them how many bytes left the box because it was Windows 10. And that caused legal to investigate the box. Fortunately, there was none of our company data on it. So we were good. But now you have the ability with Shrum or PCR type data to determine whether you've lost large amounts of data like databases, like large uh, mem dumps, like large uh, dumps of creds, et cetera, because it'll be bigger out than it'll ever be coming in. Um, enable something to allow you to hunt. If you're not hunting, you've got to learn how to do this, even if it's a couple things, but start learning how to hunt. This is something you're gonna have to do moving forward in, in the real world because as these attacks morph and get more complicated, you're going to have to eliminate you don't have certain things and figure out how to do it and get tool sets that will allow you to do these kinds of hunts, whether it's a fancy EDR, hunting tool, whatever. Um, but find ways to hunt however you can do it. You got big, anybody here got big fix? You've got a great hunting tool, for example. I can create an analysis that goes looks for all kinds of conditions and I can run tools within big fix that then spit out reports that I can say, is there anything in the report? If there's nothing in the report, then we're good. If there's something in the report, then trigger an alert and send it to me, um, for example. So it doesn't matter what you use as a tool. You may already have one. And please, map what you have to MITRE ATT&CK. It's hugely valuable here, and it definitely gives you a place to start and improve and expand upon for sure. Resources, uh, LogMD, we have a free tool as well as a paid one. Come to the booth. That's all I'm going to pitch about that. Tomorrow at 2 o'clock, I'm going to show Arthur. It is an open source project on GitHub. Um, Arthur, uh, Olaf Hartung helped me with this from Deloitte, as well as uh, MS Administrator, uh, Josh Ricard on the scheduled task stuff. And we created Arthur to solve the problem that Konza could not. And that's running binaries and getting the native reports back to a box and having more organization to the modules. So we'll show you how to do that tomorrow too. Uh, please go look at the cheat sheets. For those who did not raise your hands, please get to know these. They are quite valuable. Um, they are based on actually the WinNTI group. That's how we developed them originally. And again, uh, this presentation is recorded, and I will also post it on uh, Malware Archaeology as well. So with that, we have some time for some questions. Um, also, here's the shout out to uh, Sean's uh, post, again, because it's so important. I wanted it in here twice. So please take a picture of that. Uh, and when his white paper comes out, um, that is a must read and must do, just like the cheat sheets. Any questions? And this is where you can find us. Martin's going to come up with a dumb one, I'm sure, but you know, because he said, you know, yep, in the blue. What was the name of the malware? I named Kovter, uh, Drydex. Kovter, K O V T E R, writes their stuff to the registry. Um, they also use a myriad of ways, MSHTA, to load that call from the registry. Uh, generally, that's all EDR will detect. Uh, Drydex does DLL side loading. I mentioned that because uh, they use real Microsoft binaries in a different directory to side load the bad DLL. That's how they inject. Um, and I also mentioned WinNTI, which is a myriad of bad stuff. Any other questions? Come on, prep questions. Any email stuff I missed? 
that's a whole other presentation. All right, uh, you can find me in the booth. Come tomorrow at 2 o'clock, and uh, thanks.